Have you ever been told that you look a bit like Matt Damon? Uh, you know, surprisingly, I have. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. You look a bit like Matt Damon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know what? I think that that's good because I feel like poets are generally quite an ugly bunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like, no, but I feel like we're not attractive generally. Like, I feel like most poets, I'm like... The John Berryman style. We're yeah. like, yeah. Oh, I think that John Berryman's kind of sexy. I yeah. think that, like, but that's because I'm... In that romanticized way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I do appreciate that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And you know who told me that? It was always like these kind of it was this. I had a hairdresser when I was a kid and I was like a teenager. And like, I remember she would tell me that she'd be like, you look like Matt Damon. And I would be like, oh, thank you. Thank you. The best I ever got was Chris Hemsworth. Oh, my God. That's when I had That's longer I think hair. That Matt, I think that Matt Damon's hard to think Chris Hemsworth. Okay, I'll take it. Yeah. So thank I think you. that you should take that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. I may say male is entirely hostile. No! Dinner. Resources. Life. Friends. Is boring. We must not say so. All right, Sarah, give just a little bit. Of, I know your teacher, give listeners a little bit of your background on creative writing workshops. Yeah, so I think that I'm pretty lucky that I think I started doing the kind of creative workshop situation from a young age. I think that when I won the Foil Young Poet Competition, I think that we had kind of an environment in which there is a bunch of people who are sharing their poems and getting editorial advice from older poets. I think that... I then went to university and I think that I only did English and I think that I was very obsessed with, well, English is like what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do that kind of wanky creative writing degree. <laughs> but then I think that I went to, I went to um, do a creative writing degree and um, I think that workshops, I feel like what I find is that you really need to feel like you're being held by a jury of your peers. So yeah. I think that the kind of peer element is quite important. I think that, I teach creative writing workshops at the moment, and I do find them really fruitful. I do a few different courses, and I think that a lot of it really requires the group in which you're with, and I think that their ability to kind of put something on the line and their ability to kind of actually feel, you want to know that somebody actually wants feedback on their work. There's either a mix of people who are too smug, who are like, this is complete, or people who are often well, this is still so in progress. It's so diaphanous that so you can't even say anything. And that's what's often frustrating. <laughs> yeah. And I, that you, you teach these, you're teaching mostly undergrads, you said. Mm -hmm. You're the first one that we've had to like, that has had experience teaching workshops uh, in terms of guests coming on to talk about this. And I, I've only taught a few. And in my capacity right now, I'm not really given any workshops. You know, I just basically, they give me as an adjunct, like, you know, 101, 102 courses that I'm teaching at the community college I'm not given the chance to work with like the workshops and stuff uh you know just seniority they're never going to give that yeah. to me uh so yeah I'm always interested in that and how they're run and kind of but yeah so you've been doing this for a long time and and, and, and... I think that a lot of it has to do with something that I find again we were talking a bit about zoom versus in real life yeah i think that i have such different experiences doing things in real life which are so much more successful than when i do them on zoom i think yeah. that on zoom i often find things again i think that even between the two of us i think that i'm obviously an interrupting dickhead which i can't help but i think that in a workshop in which it's me and seven people on zoom it becomes a lot more difficult there's so many more mouths to account for right and i think that in real life i have so much more success with um doing the kind of process i think that especially also as well there's a kind of editorial process and like the reading and commentary but i feel like even the actual writing itself i think becomes very different between i think that it's very useful almost if you're going to go to a creative writing workshop in real life, I think that you're in a new space, which in some ways I feel like is creatively fruitful and you just have to go to a corner of that space and write something and then come back and share it or not. 
But I think that on Zoom, you're kind of in your house. That's an entirely different thing. And I think that that gives you maybe a certain level of comfort or ability to procrastinate that I think that changes the entire dynamic. So I think that I really find teaching creative writing a really strange thing between those those two kind of, I guess, um, I don't know, two different things. Yeah. And I think that you're right about like there's an energy too. So when you're not in person in the room with the instructor and then your peers, the energy is completely different. Like it's a completely different back and forth. People are getting cut off because of the Zoom stuff, you know, talking over one another. You can't feel it out as much. Uh, and it, it does, speaking of barriers, you know, we talk like mental health being a barrier, all this other stuff. Like it does, that could be a barrier in terms of creativity. You know, some of the technology even can be a barrier. Totally. I mean, I think that also just the idea of being in a space in which multiple people are writing at the same time, I think that there's still something quite powerful in that, where I think that being able to see the people that you're writing with, being able to actually be writing at the same time and know that everybody else is kind of entering the similar psychic space, yeah. I think is pretty important. I think that like the idea of, well, I'm just going to squirrel off away and turn my camera off. I think changes the entire dynamic yeah. and I think that that's really frustrating. And there's like a little level of competition too. Not that, it, you know, can't get out, don't oh. want to get out of control, but like that isn't required. So like when you see somebody next to you writing something, like, that's pretty good. Like yeah. I got to step up my game. You know, like it's, there is this kind of natural, I don't want to say market forces, but there's just that natural kind of competition between people where like, that's pretty good. Uh, I want to be as good as that, you know, and then you start to step up your game because somebody in the workshop is doing something cool and then vice versa, you know, it's important. No, completely. I mean, I think that also, I think that just being able to, I don't know, look your peers in the eye and yeah. be like, this is who I'm against. Like, this is who I'm working with. And <laughs> like, again, against sounds like such an antagonistic word. And so I don't mean that, but I think that there's so much something that it's like, I'm leveling up like I know what you're doing. You want to know what they're doing. Right. And I think that you have a different kind of creative competition. Like I think that something that me and my flatmates debate about a lot is the use of comp like is competition in itself healthy. Right. And I'm a very competitive person. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think that think I most definitely... writers are most artists are pretty competitive. And like there's like a culture where it's like, oh, you don't want to be seen as competitive, blah, blah. But then you look at like even the letters where they're writing back and forth back in the day. These these great artists, these great writers, they were competitive as hell. Like they were yeah. trying to do better than the person that was next to them, you know, like. Exactly. And I think that competition is in itself. I think that we can obviously make kind of capitalist critiques as to how we internalize competition. But actually competition in itself, I think is often how creative innovation happens and yeah. I think that like it's I, I like feeling competitive with writers I think that when I dated the poet it was fun because it was we were competitive with each other right. and I think that especially in a kind of creative writing workshop situation that kind of sense of well fine I'm gonna try to fuck you over a bit I think that I can do the better line happens a lot more when it's in real life rather than zoom absolutely uh, one of the questions I always ask writers when they come on here for workshop talk is is the the whole reason I started this podcast, or at least this segment of the podcast, was because there's like um, somebody, I had a listener write in, and they were, I think, a PhD student. They were telling me that uh, <clears throat> workshop culture, they kept using this phrase, mm. workshop culture, and it was somewhat negative email where they were complaining a little bit, but then it was also, you know, I think reasonable in terms of, you know, there's there's positives and negatives to workshop culture. Just what do you think of when you hear the phrase workshop culture? So I think when I think of that phrase, I think of something very specifically American that does not <laughs> exist in the UK. I think that workshop culture, I think, seems like a very specifically American idea that I think has also much more of a cultural lineage in America and I think has been kind of culturally imperialized over to the UK a bit more. But I think that we don't have the same workshop culture in the way that in the US it seems to kind of work. I mean, I think that with when I think of workshop culture, I think that I feel in some ways I count myself lucky because I think that when I was in my MFA, I think that I did not super regard the opinions of the people who I was doing it with. Right. And I had my own creative community who I really, really valued the opinions of. And I think that having a kind of creative community in which you think that 
these are the people who, when I give them my poems, I'm going to take them the most seriously. That is important for sure. But I think that this sort of, I don't know, it's almost like a dowry that you have to give when you yeah. kind of go academically in America to be like, well, I'm going to subject my work to this sort of, I don't know, opening of opinion, whether or not you think it's accurate or not. So I think that I find workshop culture a very specifically American thing, but something that I feel is increasingly coming to the UK. And I think I guess I'd say I feel generally negative about that. I'm quite an aggressive editor and I love editing poems, Yeah. but I think that I associate it more with kind of grooming oneself than actually editing. Yeah. I, that's very interesting. What do you mean by grooming like the, at least like rough general ed difference between grooming i think that and i guess i think that there's a difference between grooming which i guess i would see as working towards submission maybe to a major publication right. working in this very kind of specific way that is like popular I'm aesthetic greening yeah. yeah i'm working towards what i think like i think that whenever i edit a poem i always want to think how can I make the poem the most what it wants to be, even if it's not my style? I think that I have a lot of friends who write in ways that are very different than me, but I think that I'm able to be like, well, if you're writing in a sort of, I don't know, New York school way, I'm not going to try to make it a poem in the way that I might be writing poetry. I'm going to try to make it the best poem within that context. Right. And I feel like that for me would be editing. I guess I feel like preening or grooming would be yeah. trying to kind of make it into something that would be an ocean beyond poem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, it's such an important distinction to make too. And I think it's 100% accurate where like, are you writing to please an instructor? You know, are you writing to please the overall yeah. workshop? Are you self-censoring to please the overall workshop? And that I think that's tied up in that culture, right? Whereas there's like an expect an expected way. And then like, are you following, you know, your own intuition, your own aesthetic? Or are you trying to be like, ah, maybe I won't do that because the workshop will take it the wrong way. Or, you know, the teacher won't give me as good a grade. Yeah. Or... No, I think that it's interesting as well, to, I guess, to think about just the grade aspect of writing. <laughs> right. I mean, I think that that's something that, something that I find interesting is that I'm obviously teaching creative writing at the moment. And I think that I did not realize that so much of what I submitted when I was an undergraduate was decided by a hungover, like 27 year old right. on a whim. And I think that so many grades, I think in that way, it's kind of made me lose faith in that system. But I remember <laughs> at that time writing, I think for the two poets who were teaching my MFA and being like, there is like this one, like a few specific things where I felt like I knew that they didn't get it in one poem. And they were like, I just don't want, I, I need you to change it. And I had the kind of artistic gravitas to be like, well, I'm not going to. And I knew that I'd be marked down on it. But I think that at that, that at that point, it becomes a kind of individual squabble rather than right. like, how am I going to be graded? And I knew that I'd be graded badly necessarily on it. But I think that I was like, well, is this going to make it the better poem? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, yeah, and culture comes into it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you got your MFA, right? You got your MFA before you went to your PhD. How was that? Yeah. What was your experience with MFA and, and positive, negative, indifferent? It was, I'm pretty indifferent to it. I mean, I think that I don't keep in touch with anyone. And I think that nobody else from it has gone on to be a writer. I think that I find in the UK, MFA is probably have a different gravitas as they do from the uk from the usa uh see i'm drunk now so I, <laughs> no it's i'm I, drunk it's, now i'm we love it which i don't mind which i don't mind but i think that um i'll end up having to wrap it up and have a cigarette but then we can come back and talk if we want For but sure. i think that what <laughs> what i find is that i think that there's a sort of i think that what i found difficult is that i think that i wanted to respect the opinions of my peers more than I did. And I, right. I think that I liked doing a P I did it to get a PhD. Right. So at the time, I'm sorry, at the time I was working this horrible job, which is actually quite funny, which is that I would be sent hotels and luxury locations and I'd have to pretend that I'd been there. <sighs> so I would write a job. So I'd be in the shitty office in the middle of London being like, as I drink a pina colada in the Maldives, <laughs> 
on my honeymoon and after I've eaten like two gorgeously poached conch shells while I walked through the labyrinthine streets, it was so stupid. I think that like I was working with that job and I think I knew that I wanted to do a PhD. So I think that I was like, I'll do a creative writing one because I think that that will take a bit less effort than a actual English one. But I think that I was surprised because I feel like I wanted to be challenged more. It kind of made me angry. Like I think that I feel like, especially if I feel like I, I feel like I wanted to kind of feel more like I had peers to be like, that's dumb. Because I do write a lot of things where I'm like, that's dumb. Right. Why you they, have like, to, yeah. People should tell me a bit more that some of what I write is a bit indulgent and dumb. Right. But I think that I had no space. I think that a lot of them were writing for the first time. I think that again with like the class that we had on prosody, they'd never really done prosody before. So I think that there is a sort of element of like well at that point I think I published two pamphlets so I think that I had been very much in the poetry scene as you'd say it and I think that other people were not so I think that it was an entirely kind of different thing where I think I felt more competitive with the people who were kind of teaching me than my own students. Was there a jealousy did you sense from peers or? I think so I think that I find it hard because I feel like as a person I'm quite divisive and generally oh, we love quite that here, yeah yeah That's why we had I to have you on whole... Sarah yeah I know it's well this is why it's been so lovely to meet you I think yeah, that this has been fantastic generally, <laughs> I think that this has been actually the most fun I think that honestly I expected to come on tonight where it's like we'll see what happens <laughs> but I think that I'm actually like I'm like you know what fuck it but I think that honestly I feel like we have so much kind of culturally in common and poetically in common it's been so much fun of course but I yeah. think but I think that I really have this strong sense of, I think that I feel like I end up being divisive because I feel like, again, I don't fit into the sort of and confessional. You're I'm doing bold. Something. You have things to yeah. say and people are intimidated by that, yeah. you know, especially a pretty girl, like when it comes into well, the that's... room and then is like doing this cool, wild shit. And then you well, already have stuff published. Kind of it which it is makes like... people. Yeah which is like the mix of being actually kind of smart, which is like, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be like overly blowing my own horn, but it's like, you know what? I can write, I can write a, like, I can do this prosody thing if you want. I actually am very interested in the history of poetry. And I think that I know quite a lot about that. Right. And I think that I'm not going to just do the, I'm a pretty girl. So you know what? Do you want to hear about like, one time a guy was mean to me. I was 19 and he was 24. It's like, it's this yeah, cute, this, like trading wheels, babe. So <laughs> I think that it's like, but it's too, and I think that I feel like there's a sense of, I think that like, this is why a lot of lesbians really hate me because I think that it's like, if you are kind of, I think that, you know what, Gertrude Stein does not have a monopoly on being kind of <laughs> intelligent in a modernist way. Right. But no, I think that that's something that I feel like there is perhaps a bit of that. I think that generally also, I think that I have a, I can't shut up, which you've obviously realized through the podcast. And I think that in some ways I do feel like I'm not a huge feminist, but I feel like that makes me, I feel like that is something that makes the women in general kind of unlikable because I feel like I'm not very demure. Depends like on the setting, I guess. So like, it was just like yeah. I, I like personality. Like, I mm. like big personalities. I like people that don't care. I like people that want to say it. And I'm that type of person yeah. too. Where there's this compulsion within me, I can't not say what I'm thinking. I yeah. can't hold it back, it. even if it's a disaster at like dinner parties or something. And I'm just <laughs> no, like, well, oh actually, uh, <laughs> I don't think that. Like... I was talking to my friends about the tyranny of the PhD student <laughs> dinner party, where I think everybody makes doll. It's like the one thing that like in the UK, at least everybody like can afford lentils. So they make really shitty doll with way too much cumin <laughs> and you're there trying to eat and I, you're getting progressively drunk because you're bored. Right. And then suddenly someone's like, says something stupid and you're like, it's the imp of the perverse where it's like, I just have to chime in. Yeah. I like, I can't like, I feel like I, I will go, I'll go in being like, I'm going to be on my best behavior. Right. I'm going to be, I'm going to be so well trained. And then I'm like, okay, but you can't actually think the shit, right? And then, and then you realize that a lot of people do. 
you're, you'll, you'll looks like you'll explode otherwise unless you unless you yeah, say no, it like you're like, like oh, i should saying, hold my tongue and then you hold your well, tongue and then five minutes like later vaping, like <laughs> vaping intensely where it's like wow like they've gone weirdly silent because they're just sucking down their vape <laughs> like, what's happening now I think it's like so hey would you believe there's still an extra hour of conversation left well there is and if you want to hear the full uncensored episode you need to subscribe at patreon.com slash heavy board where you will receive full uncensored episodes like this without any interruptions ads or anything else and that's for subscribers only at patreon.com slash heavy board so what are you waiting for stop sitting on the sidelines subscribe today and join the conversation Board. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Board. I may say male is entirely hostile. No! Dinner. Resources. Life. Friends. Is boring. We must not say so. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.